Sometimes you hear Buddhist teachers treating your sense of self as if it were a logical fallacy. If you looked at events, if you looked at your life, and realize that everything is impermanent, then there can be no separate permanent self, they say. Your sense of self is, is just a, a series of actions. There's nothing substantial there. And because actions are ephemeral, you can just give them up. Then you'll be okay. That's what they say. And then they complain that people don't admit the logic of what they're saying and still hold on to their sense of self. As, again, as if it were a logical fallacy. The thing is, your sense of self is an important tool. And deep down we all realize this. If you didn't have a sense of yourself as capable of attaining your aims or being able to enjoy your aims, you wouldn't be able to do anything purposeful in life. And saying that a sense of self is just is a series of actions is not the end of the problem. Because their actions, the question is, when are they skillful and when are they not? After all, the Buddha does say you have to have yourself as your own mainstay, yourself as your governing principle. By that he means if you feel like giving up in the path, you remind yourself you embarked on this path to begin with because you wanted to put an end to suffering. And if you give up in the path, do you really love yourself? So those are cases where your sense of self is being responsible, is being capable. is necessary for the path. That's when you start identifying with things that are unskillful. That's when your sense of self gets in the way. So what are some skillful uses of self? There was a book called The Wisdom of the Ego a while back, where psychologists talked about healthy ego functions. The ego being the part of your self-committee in there that negotiates among your desires and among your sense of what you should do and what you want to do. And although your ego can have some pretty unskillful functions or unhealthy functions, it does have some healthy ones. And it turns out they all correspond to qualities of the mind needs to develop for the path. Simply that the vocabulary is different. For example, and the psychologists say that you need to have a sense of anticipation, which the Buddha would call heedfulness. Or sometimes you would call it compunction. In other words, realizing that your actions will have results and they can have a huge impact on your life for good or for bad. So you have to be very careful about what you do. Caring about how you will experience the results of your actions is an important part of acting skillfully. So heedfulness or anticipation is a healthy function in the path. Then there's altruism, realizing that if your if your happiness depends on the suffering of other people, they're not going to let they're not going to stand it and not going to allow it. So you have to take other people's well-being, other people's happiness into account. That, of course, the Buddha calls goodwill and compassion, which is another quality we develop. And it's a goodwill is a healthy ego function. There's suppression, which is different from repression. Suppression is, repression is when you Say no to something and pretend it didn't happen in the mind. Suppression is when you know it's there, but you can still say no. And in the Buddhist vocabulary, that's restraint. Both restraint over what you take into the senses, or how you look at things, how you listen to things. Noting that if you're looking for the purpose of lust or greed or aversion, you better look in another way. 
Restraint also, of course, has to do with restraint over what you say and do and think. So you re suppress the urges to do things unskillful. And you have to replace those urges with, with another form of happiness, that's sublimation in psychologist terms. The Buddha doesn't have a term for this, but he does recommend that you develop concentration as a source of well-being in the mind that is totally harmless. It doesn't require that you do anything unskillful to develop it, and it doesn't have a bad impact on the mind. As he said, if you have this pleasure, the pleasure of the first jhana going up, then when you see the bad effects of sensuality, you are in a position where you can give them up. If you don't have this alternative form of happiness, then no matter how much you understand that sensuality is bad for you, you're still going to keep going back for sensuality because you see that you think it's the only alternative to pain. So you take your desire for happiness and you channel it in a more productive way. And finally, in the psychologist list, there's humor, learning to step back from your foibles and laugh at them. Again, the Buddha doesn't use this term, but there are lots of examples in the canon, especially in the Vinaya, of the Buddha's humor. And it's interesting that it is in the Vinaya. Because after all, part of presenting the rules is to make you want to follow them. And if you can laugh at the behavior of the person who incited the rule to begin with, it puts you in a position where you can step back from that own behavior in yourself. And also you realize if these rules were created by someone who had a good sense of humor, you trust them more. You're more willing to take them on. Then there are other functions that the Buddha talks about, but the psychologists don't. The primary one is shame. Psychologists seem to have a real thing about how bad shame is for you, but the Buddha says shame can be healthy. When you think about people you respect and realize that your behavior is beneath you, that they would think less of you for following that kind of behavior, that's a healthy sense of self. In other words, it's a shame that comes from high self-esteem rather than low self-esteem. So these are ways in which a healthy sense of self is an important part of the path. And so even though the self is, as you experience it, is a kind of activity, the Buddha never goes into the issue of whether there really is or really is not a self behind that, behind that activity. Because if you answer that question, either way you're going to get involved in a wrong view. But he does focus you on the activity. And as I said, he doesn't just leave it there saying, well, you see your sense of self as a process, that's the end of the problem because then you have nothing solid to hold on to. People can hold on to processes as much as they can hold on to solid things. They can cling to unskillful process processes just as easily as they can cling to unskillful things. It simply takes the issue of self into the area of karma. And then you look at it as a kind of karma. And as I said, the question always there is, when is it skillful, when is it not? And you find that your sense of self will change as you progress on the path. And basically what you want to do is eventually is get it out of the way and get the whole question out of the way. The Buddha has you focus on activities as skillful or not. And as long as there remains something to develop in the mind or something to abandon in the mind, you're going to need a sense of self to motivate yourself and to get a clear sense of what needs to be done. It's only when you've brought the path almost to completion, and you realize the only attachment that's left is that sense of self, the self that's directing things. And you see it simply as one more activity. Things arising, things passing away. That even when it's skillful, it, those activities are stressful. So you're looking at them not in terms of self or not self, you're looking at them more in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Or at, at this point, as John Munn says, the Four Noble Truths collapse into one. <laughs>
whatever arises is stressful. And what do you do with it? You develop this passion for it and let it go. That's it. At that point, you're not even thinking in terms of whether your self exists or doesn't exist. In fact, you're not even thinking in terms of existing or not existing. As the Buddha explains, when you see things arising in the senses, the idea of non-existence just doesn't occur to you. You see things passing away. The idea of existence doesn't occur to you. So the question of whether a self exists or not, that wouldn't occur to you either. Those terms just get put out of the way. Whether you consciously put them out of the way or simply they just don't occur to you, the result is the same. You see that an action is unskillful and stressful, you let it go. Even if it's skillful and stressful, you let it go at that point. And the issue of self or not self disappears. Years back there was a controversy in Thailand. There was one Buddhist sect that claimed that nirvana was your true self. And a lot of Buddhist scholars came out and unmasked and said, no, 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 nirvana is not self. Someone once then went asked Jamahabua whether nirvana was self or not self, and he says, nirvana is nirvana. Then he explained, not self is a tool, self is a tool. You use the tools until they've done their work and then you put them down. So at that point, the whole issue of self and not self existing and not existing doesn't really occur to the mind. But before you reach that point, you can't just drop your sense of self because someone says it's a logical fallacy or just because it's ephemeral. After all, we have to feed. And feeding. If we don't admit that we have a sense of self that's operating behind that, then it just goes behind the scenes and we can never do anything about it. The purpose of the path is to train the mind so that it feeds in better and better ways until finally it doesn't need to feed anymore. It finds something that doesn't require any sustenance. At that point, your sense of who you are doing all this is also unnecessary. You put it aside. But for the time being, we have to focus on what are the skillful ways of selfing, what are the skillful ways of acting. We are working on a skill. And learning how to be skillful in who in this committee of your mind you identify with and who you don't is going to make a huge difference. So remember, the issue is not what you are, it's what are you doing, and are you doing it well? What are you feeding on? What are your feeding habits? Can you learn to feed in a more skillful way? When you pursue those questions, you find that they lead to something really good. If you simply say, well, I have, my self is very impermanent, so I'll just let go of any idea of self, all the feeding goes underground where you can't see it. And you end up just kind of floating around. So choose the questions that lead you to develop skills. The skills of the path. And you'll find that they'll reward you. Their answers will reward you many times over. <laughs>